Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of PACT. In this section, we're going to cover malware evasion techniques. So some of the malware evasion techniques we will cover include evading debuggers, disassemblers and virtual machines. We will also cover data encoding, polymorphism and a few other anti-detection strategies that you may have or may have not come across. In this video, we will be covering anti-debugging. Some of the things we will look at are debugger terms, which we will come across, basic working logic of debuggers, and the strategies used by malware researchers to avoid or rather evade debuggers. So let's get into the definitions. When it comes to debuggers, as we noticed, registers are quite important. And some of the registers that we did not discuss include trap flags and e flags. So, what's a trap flag? This is basically a register that permits operation of a processor in a single step mode. So you may choose to say, I want to understand only this operation. That's where a trap flag comes in. So when you do set a trap flag, you are able to stop execution within the debugger at the point of the trap flag. This is one key feature of debuggers. When it comes to an E flag, this again will contain a few registers that we may use. For instance, you may choose to have a resume flag a virtual 8086 mode flag which is supported by the 386 plus processor only and then a virtual interrupt flag which will be actually very key to work similarly to a trap flag among others so all these flags help us understand or rather set various operations most of the others are meant to perform specific tasks and are usually not under our control we only obey them more when the program is executing. However, when it comes to these ones, we can use them to take control. And also, in a bit, we will discuss how they can be used to detect debuggers from a malware perspective. Another important thing we discussed is breakpoints. Now, for breakpoints, they may come into formats. We may have one which is in regard to software that simply pushes a certain reference or other instruction in memory, which is the 0xcc or a software interrupt. This stops execution. Hardware breakpoints help us perform interrupts at a hardware level. These are usually referenced between DR0 to DR3 in memory references. So each will give a certain form of response that can tell us what we're dealing with. We also have memory breakpoints that rely on guard pages. However, these are not very commonly used when it comes to malware detection rather malware detecting debuggers. Lastly, we have another method that is commonly used, which is conditional breakpoints, where you only interrupt if a certain memory address points to the stack. These are really key fundamentals of debuggers. So looking at that, that means most debuggers will work in an instruction stepping mode. As you have seen, all this involve that interrupting execution, which is quite key. So if interrupting execution is the key, we need to also be able to detect from a malware perspective that execution has been interrupted. Now, when it has been interrupted, as a malware developer, you would consider either to exit the program or try stop the debugger. So one is an aggressive mode, the other is more passive, where you attempt to hide your bomb if a debugger is detected, for instance. So as you have put it, we will detect breakpoints and we would also detect flags. So for instance, when dealing with detecting breakpoints, let's take a software breakpoint as an example. So what we will do is if a program pushes the 0xcc instruction, we will XOR it against a value of our choice like 0x55 and use that result within memory to tell us or rather that arithmetic operations within the accumulator register to tell us whether there is a debugger in place or not. If there's a debugger, we would choose to perform a certain action, either break execution or simply work against the debugger. Another key thing is using the flags. So let's take a trap flag for instance. If we perform a single step instruction and then for instance do the push F where we are setting the flag to the stack and then it performs its operations before and setting the trap flag and popping it from memory be able to detect another interrupt. Another thing is detecting API calls. 
we will look at this in a bit more detail. So for instance, we may use the drivers within the machine to detect certain activity. For instance, if a debugger is present or find a window handle that shows there's a debugger and the likes. Uh, additionally, we would also look at timing attacks. Just for instance, by looking at the assembly format or rather assembly instruction that is used to read the timestamp. This is not as common. And then the malware may also perform checksums on itself. So for instance, you do a CRC32 check on the malware itself during execution and tries to find a hard-coded value. If it doesn't, it may have detected that it's running within a debugger. This is because you're setting the checksums to work with certain conditions. So within a debugger, there will most likely be modification to calls, which means there will be a modification of the cyclic redundancy check. Another state is self-debugging. However, this is not very commonly used. So how self-debugging works is you would associate your malware with every process it's running in. So if you find that your malware is associated with debugging call, then that already shows signs of a debugger. And lastly, the malware developer can send rogue instructions. This is basically anything that will throw the debugger off course. Let's take a look at an example. This is a simple anti-debugging technique that involves API calls. We're looking at the Windows 32 API. So what's happening here is we will check, or rather we will import certain functions, that is Windows and the standard input-output. This is a basic C program. So within this, there is a call to very many drivers. As you saw, when you're dealing with imports, you get to see quite a number of functionality imported from drivers existing on the machine. On Windows, you get quite a number of functionalities imported from drivers existing on the machine. So we'll take a look at one within the kernel 32 DLI. So this, this driver contains a function that checks whether a debugger is present. So as you can see, it makes it quite easy. So in our case, the program doesn't do much because this is not really malware. It would be a component of the concealer so that we can hide intent. So we would include this in our concealer if we wanted to use it. So what it does is it checks if a debugger is there. If a debugger is present, which is the first condition, then exit. You see, when that happens, if this was malware and this was placed in our concealer, we would place it in a debugger. The next section is if that check fails, that means we are not running in a debugger. So we will perform any action that the user deems fit. I hope this makes it a bit clear as to how malware uses anti-debugging techniques within its concealer.